Welcome back. In this video, we'll be discussing message integrity and digital signatures, including cryptographic hash functions and message authentication codes, and building up an authentication protocol from basic elements. Let's get started. Okay, welcome back. This is our third video looking at network security. And in the last video, we talked about the principles of cryptography. So we saw a little bit about the tools that we have to work with, meaning symmetric key cryptography and public key cryptography. But just knowing those tools exist is quite a ways from actually being able to use them in a protocol where we can achieve goals like authentication and message integrity. And spoiler alert, we can't actually have authentication reliably without message integrity. So we'll talk about those two network security goals today. So again, we have Bob and Alice, and Bob wants to know who's talking to him, and Alice says, I am Alice. Great, job done. But wait, our attacker says, I am Alice. Who's Bob to believe? In real life, of course, if Bob already knows Alice, he might recognize her face or her voice or have some other way of verifying that he's actually talking with Alice. But in a network, we just have the bits. And so the bits, I am Alice, coming from one or from another, look exactly the same. There's no way for the recipient to differentiate them. So let's put this in the context of a network packet. Now we have I am Alice, and in the header of that packet, we have Alice's source IP address. The problem here? Well, the attacker can also generate a packet and spoof Alice's source IP address. Yes, there may be some places in the network that this won't work from, but in general, attackers can spoof IP addresses. So that is not a reasonable authentication method. Okay, now we're up to authentication protocol 3.0, where Alice says, I am Alice, and sends her secret password to prove it. And then Bob acknowledges this back to Alice. What could go wrong here? Well, assuming our attacker is able to record that initial communication, they can do what's called a replay attack. Just save the message with I am Alice and the secret password, and the attacker can then send a copy of this packet out anytime they want to. So here we have the spoofed packet, Alice's source IP address, Alice's password, I am Alice. From Bob's perspective, this is just as legitimate as the one that actually came from Alice. Then the okay goes back to Alice's IP address. And if the attacker is able to listen on this connection, they're probably able to get the response and intercept that as well. So that is the playback attack. So we modify that a little bit. And the change here is that the password is encrypted, right? So that could be encrypted with Bob's public key, which we know is a secure protocol. Well, turns out the playback attack still works, right? Assuming Bob's public key hasn't changed in between, all the attacker needs is a copy of the encrypted password. They don't actually have to prove that they know the password, the plain text password in this scenario. They can just replay the ciphertext of the password. So still no bueno. The playback attack still works. All right, now we're on to version four of our authentication protocol. And our number one goal here is avoiding the playback attack. So here we have a nonce or a number that's only used once in a lifetime. So this is like the proof of life. Alice has to show that they're actually able to encrypt this once in a lifetime number with the shared secret key. So Alice says, I am Alice. Bob replies back, here's a nonce, prove it. Alice sends back the encrypted version of the nonce, proving her identity. But what could go wrong here? Well, of course they had to get a shared secret key and we haven't yet talked about how they might do that. So our authentication protocol, try five, is also going to use public key cryptography instead of a shared secret key. So I am Alice, Bob says, here's a nonce, prove it. And Alice, notice that's a K minus A of R. So Alice uses her private key to encrypt R. Now Bob needs Alice's public key in order to decrypt that, which Alice can provide, or maybe Bob got it from Alice's website or from some other third party that certifies public keys. So Alice sends over her public key and is able to compute that what Alice sent before was encrypted with her private key. But wait, there's more. There's still a problem with this exchange. So we have our attacker in the middle. Alice says, I am Alice. The attacker repeats that to Bob. Bob sends the nonce to our attacker, Trudy, and Trudy encrypts R with her private key. Bob asks for the public key. Trudy sends the public key. And guess what? The computation checks out because Trudy supplied both the public and private key. 
So we still haven't gotten to the point where Bob would have confidence in who's saying they're Alice. Trudy can also forward the nonce on to Alice and have her encrypted and provide the public key. If Bob then proceeds to send his personal message to Alice, of course, Trudy's sitting in the middle. Trudy's sitting in the middle. And so while Bob has encrypted it, he's done so with Trudy's public key. And so of course, Trudy can decrypt that message and can forward the message on to Alice encrypted with her public key. And so Bob and Alice don't even know that Trudy's in the middle and has read the message that they've exchanged. So the question is, where are the mistakes in this protocol? How can we fix this? And the answer is we need to talk about message integrity before we can fix that protocol. As a reminder, message integrity means that we can tell if a message has been changed en route. So the recipient needs to be able to confirm that the sender sent the message and they received it in the same form, or if it has been changed, they can tell that it's not the same as the sender originally intended. So they're called signatures because they're analogous to handwritten signatures, which are supposed to be evidence that the message is from who it says it's from and hasn't been changed. And so the sender, Bob in this case, digitally signs a document and that shows that he's the document owner, creator, what have you. And so the property that we want here is that it's verifiable. So the recipient can say, yes, this is Bob's digital signature. It identifies him as the originator of the document and the fact that this document is intact and it should be non-forgeable. So a simple way to do this, given that we have public key cryptography, is Bob can sign the message by encrypting it with his private key. So this is now a signed message and anybody with Bob's public key can decrypt the message. So it's not confidential, but given that they're able to decrypt it with Bob's public key, they know that it must have been encrypted by Bob because he's the only one that has the private key. So the end result is if the public key is able to decrypt the message and get us back the original message, then we know that the signer must have been the holder of the private key, Bob in this case. So Alice has verified that Bob signed the message and nobody else, and that the message is intact, right? The message hasn't changed in transit because when she decrypted it using the public key, she got back the same message. This also brings up the issue of non-repudiation. So if Bob later says, no, I never said that, Alice can use the signature to prove that Bob said this because he signed it. So as we noted, public key encryption is computationally expensive. So if we have a long message, we don't really want to encrypt the whole thing using public key cryptography just to prove that it hasn't changed. So instead we use digests, meaning we use a hash function to get M. We haven't talked much about hash functions, but they're fast, they're one-way functions. So we could have a message that's arbitrarily long, could be gigabytes. If we apply a hash function to it, it'll run fairly quickly and we will get a message digest of a fixed size. It might be 128 bits or what have you, whatever the property of this hash function is. It's important to note, this is not a ciphertext. We cannot take the digest and get back the message because we've lost information by applying the hash function. However, for any change to the message, it's highly probable that we would get a different hash and the hash space is relatively large. It's many to one, meaning there are multiple messages that would give the same hash, but it's very hard to find what are called hash collisions. So different messages that generate the same hash. The property that we like about it is we get this fixed size message digest, also called the fingerprint. And because it's small, then it is computationally easy to assign the message digest. However, it is computationally infeasible given the digest to reverse engineer a message that would give that same digest. Thinking all the way back to the internet checksum, that is in fact a hash function. It's just not one with very good cryptographic properties because it can be easily reverse engineered but it has the properties that we said identify a hash function, meaning it gives a fixed length digest, right? No matter how many 16 bit blocks we sum together using the internet checksum, we still get 16 bits out. So that's effectively our digest. It is many to one. Um, it's just not good cryptographically because given a hash value, it's easy to find a message with the same hash value. We can mathematically generate one. So there are well-known hash functions that are used in practice, such as SHA-128 or SHA-256. And so we can use these to generate the digests of messages. So here's the process. Bob has a large message. He runs it through a hash function, giving us H of M, which is no longer representative of the message, but it's this message digest. He then uses this private key to encrypt the message digest and he sends the encrypted message digest along with the original message. On the receiving end, 
We have both the large message in plain text and this message digest. We're able to apply Bob's public key to the digital signature, decrypting it and giving us the unencrypted message digest. And we can apply the hash function, which is known as part of the protocol, to the message, and these should match. Right? And then we can confirm that Bob did in fact generate the digest and sign it. If they're not equal, then we would know that the plain text message must have changed in transit and it no longer matches the message digest. And so we've achieved this notion of message integrity. We know that the message has changed and we can no longer trust it. Or we know that someone else actually signed this, not Bob. And so the message isn't really from Bob. Either way, you can't trust the message. You might've seen the name MD5. That's a very common hash function that computes 128-bit message digests, as well as SHA-1, which is a NIST standard and generates 160-bit message digests. Of course, the larger the size of the message digest, the less probable it will be for a collision to happen, meaning two different messages that have the same digest. Okay, now we can revisit our authentication protocol 5.0, now that we understand message integrity. So the problem was that our attacker was able to pose as Alice to Bob and as Bob to Alice and be in the middle decrypting the messages and reading them and then re-encrypting them and passing them along. So there was our original scenario. Bob thinks he's talking to Alice, Alice thinks she's talking to Bob, but actually they're both talking to Trudy in the middle and she's able to read the messages. So we need a little more information to actually fix this problem. As a, one more example of the issue, we have Trudy playing a pizza prank on Bob. So Trudy creates an email order to the pizza store. Please deliver to me four pepperoni pizzas. Thank you, Bob. So she impersonates Bob, sends the order. All right, Bob's going to get pizzas. We, we know where this is going. Trudy signs the order with her private key and sends it to the pizza store and sends the pizza store her public key, but claims that it's Bob's public key. So the pizza store verifies the signature, right? Trudy sent both, so of course they match. And the pizza store then delivers four pepperoni pizzas to Bob, who, as it happens, doesn't like pepperoni pizza. Don't know what's wrong with him, but that's neither here nor there. So this is where the role of certification authorities come in, or CAs. And you may have seen this term uh, relative to the certificates for HTTPS websites, for example. So the CA binds a particular public key to a particular entity. The entity could be a person, a website, a business, a device. In any case, the key is registered, and when it's registered, some out-of-band proof of identity is used to show the CA, yes, I'm that entity, here's my public key. So the CA then maintains these bindings and creates a certificate containing the entity's public key, and it's digitally signed by the certificate authority. And so that signature then represents the certificate authority saying, this is E's public key. Bob's no longer asking Alice for her public key, which that message can be intercepted by whoever. Bob goes to the certificate authority and says, give me Alice's public key. All right, so now Alice wants Bob's public key. Alice can get Bob to send her a message encrypted with his private key, but he, she's not gonna ask Bob for his public key. Alice is gonna go to the certificate authority and the certificate authority is say, gonna say, here's Bob's key encrypted with our public key. So then Alice can apply the CA's public key to the certificate, get Bob's public key, and then decrypt the message from Bob and verify that it indeed matches Bob's public key from the CA. Now, if we think back to our problem with the authentication protocol, it's solved because Trudy can no longer be in the middle of the exchange of public keys. So she can no longer substitute her public key for Alice's public key and Bob's public key. And so then she would no longer be able to encrypt and decrypt on their behalf and have that whole surreptitious arrangement. All right, that's all for now. Next, we're going to look at how this applies to securing email. We'll see you on the next video. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.